Hi everyone, uh, my name once again is Alish Bajan. Uh, on behalf of I Automotive IQ and IQPC Limited, I'd like to welcome all of you back to the new technologies for all electric and hybrid aircraft 2021 a conference. For those of you that joined us yesterday, I'd like to of course um, hope that you enjoy the proceedings as well as the discussions that we had um, yesterday afternoon or morning, depending on where you're located. Today, of course, we will hear from three new speakers on three completely distinct topics. Of course, we're going to be kicking things off in just a moment with the opening presentation from the uh, gentleman that is joining me on screen. Um, Peter, welcome to the meeting. Wonderful to be here. And the title of the story today is Speed Equals Profits. And if I do a good job telling the story, you'll understand clearly why that's the title when we get to the end. We have conceived the VI-400 high-speed VTOL aircraft. VTOL in our case means the wing tilts. It points straight up for takeoff and landing, like a helicopter, and then it tilts down, uh, all the way down, to be like an airplane for crews in between. So that is what allows the VI-400 to be high speed. 410 miles an hour, 356 knots, 660 kph, and also have long range, 500 miles. That's 435 nautical miles or 805 kilometers. So it's a unique aircraft. The tilt wing design is perhaps the most efficient VTOL design because we get to use the same structure for vertical as well as horizontal flight. So we see this as the next generation VTOL aircraft and it has been driven. And the point of my story today is to explain how this aircraft design has been driven by our concept for a next generation regional travel service. So how does the Vi-400 compare to other VTOL aircraft that are under development? Well, as you can see, it can go much farther and much faster than the all-electric aircraft, such as Volocopters, Archers, Liliums, or Jovies. What we're showing here in this diagram is range versus distance. So on the far axis, you have speed, how fast the aircraft can go, and on the near axis, you have distance. And we've arrayed the cities in the Northeast of the United States, Boston, New York City, and Washington, D.C., by how far apart they are from each other. And you can see that the green arc for the VI covers both the speed and the distance necessary to travel from Boston to New York or Boston to Washington, DC. Well, none of the electrics can make it that far. Uh, they have neither the range nor the speed to be able to uh, offer a service that goes city to city. Why can we do this? Well, the VI is an EV tall in that all the systems on it are electric, except for the main onboard power, which is produced by a turbine engine, the GE CT7-8 turbo shaft helicopter engine. Uh, and it's a parallel hybrid EV tall architecture because we have a one megawatt motor generator designed to the aircraft that will provide electrical power to power all the other systems on the aircraft. So the actuation, the fly-by-wire flight control, the pressurization, um, you know, it's actually a very simple aircraft design because of electric. The only systems that really run through the aircraft are the redundant power and data buses, the wires that connect all the electric components together. Uh, we don't have any hydraulics. We don't have any in-wing fuel tanks, so there's no fuel lines running through it. We've really kept this aircraft design super simple, and electric has been key to that. So we are a huge uh, supporter of the electric aircraft revolution, um, and it's going to continue to evolve from this point. But we've made a set of interesting and I think unique design choices that have been guided by this need to go a long distance fast with VTOL. So let's talk some more about that. However, I have to speak to the elephant in the room. Uh, there's a notion that the only way to be sustainable in aviation today is to use battery electric architecture. Um, and that's a fine elephant. And in fact, it was more or less true uh, perhaps if you go back 10 years ago, but the pressure to decarbonize the world has put a huge pressure on decarbonizing transportation, all transportation. And so sustainable alternative fuels, in our case, sustainable aviation fuels, sometimes called SAFs, have been under serious development for nearly that whole decade. Um, and there's a wide variety of companies going after them. Now, many of those sustainable alternative fuels start with bio inputs, um, and uh, it remains to be seen how effective those can be. But we are very excited that we've been able to partner with a startup called Prometheus Fuels. 
And that gives us sustainability without compromise. Prometheus has a technology, which you can see one of their prototypes there in the background of this slide, that takes sustainable electric inputs, so solar power, wind power, and air. And it takes water vapor from the air, carbon dioxide out of the air, and produces out the backside certified fuels. So whether that's gasoline or diesel fuel, or in our case, Jet A. And the significance of this is huge because they're packaging wind and solar energy in a liquid form that we can use in our turbine and be net zero carbon emitting. So the carbon comes out of the air, goes into the fuel, we burn it, it goes back into the air and cycles around. So our flights will be net zero carbon. So that is sustainability without compromise. Um, and they're being, they're, they're, they're successful, with their exciting, potential success of this technology has been recognized with their recent uh, B round, where Maersk led that round, the global shipping giant. So you can see how important this decarbonization is, not just to us, but really globally. When you have a shipping giant like Maersk uh, pushing this, we know that it is bound for success. So why does anyone need to go so fast? Why do we have to go over 400 miles an hour? Overhead. So hold that thought. I'm going to explain. What is the art service that we've conceived of? It's aerial regional transport. There is, pre-COVID in the U.S., an existing $20 billion market of airline tickets. It's just the airline tickets for city-to-city -city travel, regional flights in the U.S. So you can see we've identified 41 city pairs where the range of the VI and the speed of the VI will allow us to offer a competitive service. So we've optimized the VI 400 for stage lengths of 150 to 500 miles. And we're excited about serving this market for a couple reasons. First is it's a proven market. People already fly from these cities to cities to do business and for leisure purposes. Um, and it's a market that we know is going to see significant growth. Why? Simple. Population growth and economic growth drive city to city travel. There is going to be continued population growth. There's going to be continued economic growth. And therefore, we know this market will grow for us. So what we've designed is a faster, more convenient intercity travel option. It slots in among existing regional travel options. It's going to be a green, sustainable relief valve for the congestion that people experience in city to city travel today. The art service really is gonna stand alone as being the only service that can provide high speed, low cost city to city VTOL transportation. Let's unpack that a little bit. So what does low cost mean? Because that is really the most important factor in all of this. So there are low cost city to city alternatives right now. Those are rail travel, airline travel, highway travel, whether you drive yourself or take a, a bus. And that's what we're really competing with, with the art service. So in contrast, uh, electric airplanes have city to city range but they're gonna to struggle to achieve low cost for reasons that have nothing to do with the aircraft architecture. And this was a key learning I had when I switched career tracks from high tech to aviation and stepped in as president and COO of Linear Air. Linear Air was operating Eclipse Very Light Jets and went on to handle trips on Cirruses and other piston aircraft. In fact, we even offered scheduled service on Cirrus aircraft between Boston and New York. I learned a huge amount about how people buy and think about buying travel on aircraft of this scale. And a lot of what I learned is non-intuitive. When I came into the business, I had a lot of reasonable sounding notions about how people would buy travel. And I spent five years at Linear Air systematically disproving almost all of them. So one of the problems you have is that with an electric airplane, a small one today, because you can't build a big one yet with an all electric airplane, uh, you have to use reliever airports. So these are airports that are not the big airports serving a major city, but they're the satellite airports around it. Uh, the reason you can't use the big airport is it's priced, the landing fees and other things are priced to make it prohibitively expensive to use a small aircraft there. They don't want you mixing in with the big jets and they, they will penalize you with pricing to do that. So what's the problem with a reliever airport? Well, the problem is it costs money to get there unless you live nearby, but very few people comparatively live near them. Population density is low near them. So if you want to travel from a city center, where most of the business is, to another city center where your meeting is going to be, you have to take ground transportation out to a reliever airport. 
And this is one of these surprising factors that people who design aircraft, and, but have not operated aircraft as I have, don't know and don't take into account. And it's actually the ground transportation cost that raises the price of city to city for any small aircraft, electric or not, so that it's no longer competitive with airline travel, and so no longer low cost. Um, I'm sometimes asked if this art service is such a great idea, why don't people do it with helicopters? Well, and the reason for that is helicopters, although they have city to city range, aren't fast enough, they're not high speed. And so they're not fast enough to let you do enough trips per day. It's, it comes down to capital utilization. Um, well, it's actually operating costs and capital utilization. Because they're slow, they spend a lot of time burning fuel and wearing out parts in the air. And that adds to direct operating costs. But it's mostly about capital utilization. You can't get enough trips done per day to um, amortize your overhead, which I'm going to go into more detail on. Uh, high speed, we've got the AW609, Leonardo's civil derivative of the V22. It's a tilt rotor. It can go fast. It can go city to city, but it's very expensive. They're projecting a $24 million purchase price, which is twice a medium twin helicopter. Um, and it's a complex aircraft with dual rotor heads and big rotors and a lot of mechanical interlinks. It's you know, its maintenance costs will not be low. Um, if we look at the other VTOLs that you may be familiar with, the eVTOLs, Joby, Archer, Beta, et cetera, as we saw from the earlier picture, they don't have the range to go city to city. And so that is going to make them uh, capitally inefficient if you tried to offer service with them. You'd have, and you'd have multiple stops, which people really wouldn't want. Um, so either way, you, you end up with something that doesn't let you do it at low cost. The last thing I want to highlight is you can see features of our aircraft that come out of achieving these goals. Um, so we talked about it being a single turbine engine. That leads to it having a whole airframe parachute, as well as the megawatt motor generator parallel hybrid architecture. Uh, it's all fly-by-wire. The VTOL design gives us access to the middles of cities where there's a lot of demand. And then a sort of unknown one is a low aspect ratio wing. It has a rather stubby wing, and it can have that for high, that, that allows it to go fast. That allows it to have a high speed cruise. But it can have that because it takes off and lands vertically. If it had to take off and land sometimes like an airplane, it would need a much bigger wing, and then it wouldn't be able to go fast. So all of these things combine together to allow us to offer this uniquely competitive service with a unique aircraft designed for the needs of that service from the very beginning. So the result is we're breaking the curve. Only our service with the Vi 400 can offer this revolutionary combination of low door-to-door -door time under an hour and a half, Boston, New York. Every other way you do it ends up being around four hours. Uh, you can see the other ways to do it are airlines, rail, and auto today. There really aren't any services using King Airs, Pilatus, Cessnas, or helicopters. And you can see why. They're expensive. And again, the reason they're expensive is because and for the fixed wings, it's the ground travel costs to and from or lever airports and the lack of demand, which means you can't fill all the seats. And so you have to amortize your empty seats. Uh, the helicopters are penalized uh, because they're slow. So the key breakthrough here is innovating by combining off the shelf components into uh, aircraft that can let us have this revolutionary value proposition for travelers. So we'd like to say jet speed ensures profitability for operators. And what does fast mean? Well, fast means 36 minutes Boston to New York City from uh, skids up to skids down, or 39 minutes London to Paris, 55 minutes San Francisco to LA. So that's fast. And since we're targeting city center people, the ground travel time is low. You know, Ideally, people would walk from their office to a Viport to depart and then walk to their meeting. Um, worst case, they take a five or 10 minute taxi or Uber ride. Interestingly, high speed contributes significantly to being affordable. Uh, it has 50% lower variable costs per mile versus a Bell 407 GXP, which is a comparably sized single turbine engine helicopter. Uh, and the reason for that is the Vi just spends a third the time beating up parts in the air, third the time burning gas. So even though it burns more fuel per hour, since it goes almost three times faster, it ends up burning much less per mile. Now, here's another key thing I'm very proud of with the design of the Vi 400 that came directly from my frustrations at linear air 
offering air travel on light GA aircraft, light general aviation aircraft of the scale that we're all talking about right now with the VTOL revolution. Um, light GA aircraft are marketed so that the, uh, the specs they quote, like six seats, out, you know, the range, the luggage capacity, those are generally pick one, right? They're not all true at once. And so that meant in revenue service, I couldn't count on filling all the seats unless it was a couple adults and children. So with the VI, we've, all the specs you will see us publish for the civil version of the VI are going to be at max gross weight with a 200 pound pilot, five 200 pound passengers, each of which can have 50 pounds of roll aboard and personal item. Why am I stressing this? You can't make money if you can't let people travel with their luggage, right? I've tried shipping luggage separately, doesn't work. People hate it. Just why the reason people don't check bags in an air, uh, you know, on an airline flight, they don't want their bag out of sight because they know it adds risk to their travel. People hate risk to their their travel. So we wanted to make sure people could bring on their rollerboards. So there's this storage for five rollerboards on board and this uh, package shelf behind the rear seats. Uh, there's storage for personal items at your elbow. So this is um, this is a design that is going to be practical, also but very comfortable. The seats are 23 inches wide. It's two inches wider than a first class seat. And almost most importantly of all, this aircraft is wheelchair accessible. We've designed this so people who are mo mobility disabled will be able to easily get on and off the aircraft. There's no high sill to climb over. There's no climbing up on a wing. Um, we can pull a wheelchair right over the lip of the aircraft into the cabin and help them get into the comfortable seat. And we really think that's a very important aspect of this design to design for people who are mobility disabled. You know, research shows that uh, they don't take 90% of the trips they'd like to because current travel options are so limited. So we are really hoping to help turn that around for uh, the 14% of the U.S. population that is mobility disabled. Now, the aircraft, of course, is a really sexy and key part of the art service, but it's not the whole story. Without a place to take off and land, without infrastructure, we don't have a service. So we had to conceive of a matching Viport infrastructure concept that would support our service concept. So what we're planning to do is make use of underutilized public assets in order to slot in, as I said, around existing transport modes. So one of those assets is the waterfronts in major cities around the world. Um, in many parts of the world, major cities were developed around waterborne commerce. And if you looked at Boston Harbor, this is Boston Harbor on the right here. If you looked at that 150 years ago, that would be a, a forest of masts, of sailing ship masts and smokestacks uh, belching out uh, steam and coal smoke. Um, the, the harbor is essentially empty now. So we have the opportunity to use that for our infrastructure, and that's our plan. So what you see here is our Viport, which is a modular design. So this is the smallest unit. The smallest unit has two Vi pads on it uh, and the embarkation lounge that you can see here. Uh, again, fully handicapped accessible. And this is designed at, to match the characteristics of the Vi in that we're going from a centralized transportation infrastructure with large airports that people have to wade through congestion to get to, um, and then can be concentrated on the large aircraft. We're taking small VTOL aircraft. We're going to distribute them around the city so that you can walk to the end of your street and get to a Viport. So the idea is to distribute these around the city at locations where there's uh, demand and of, and, of course, the ability to accommodate that. So the Viport is barge-based. It has integrated um, refueling and, uh, and uh, fire extinguishing, fire suppression. Uh, it's zero emission itself. Uh, it has solar panels on the roof to power its electric power. Uh, it's crash and hurricane proof, a really important part of infrastructure, especially if you're gonna site it on the water. Uh, it has built-in runoff capture, and that's a really important feature for zero emission. The uh, any gray water that runs off the aircraft, any fuel spill is goes through these por porous bipads uh, and is captured underneath, automatically separated into tanks, and then those are recycled as as necessary. So this gives us a modular, distributed, and mobile infrastructure. We can actually move these. Uh, they you know, bring a tugboat up and take it someplace else. So as we adapt and grow our service, we can adapt and grow the infrastructure with it. 
The last thing about this that I really like is I have yet to talk to a helicopter pilot who is comfortable with rooftop landings. Rooftop landings come with very unpredictable winds from urban canyons and from structure around the building and from the building itself. Um, so part of our goal with this design was to make this as uh, comfortable an infrastructure as possible for pilots to take off and land from. So I promised I would explain overhead. So now you get a little bit of an accounting lecture. <laughs> and why is an accounting lecture doing in, in a talk about new technologies in electric aircraft? Well, I, I really want to hit home how we've designed this aircraft based on a business model. And what it really comes down to is that the cost structure of any travel service, you can sort of simplistically think of it as being composed of operating costs, overhead costs, and then hopefully profits on top of that. Now, any travel service only gets paid to deliver people safely to their destination. And the difference between a ticket price that they pay for that service and the cost to deliver them is the operating margin. Okay? So you'll see here, if I take the operating margin, it needs to cover both the operating costs and the overhead. If you don't cover the operating costs and the overhead, well, what happens is the overhead sticks up out of there and you end up with losses. And this, unfortunately, has been kind of the chronic problem of many aviation services over the years. Um, the airline business was not considered a great business to be in, in no small part because it can be very challenging to uh, cover your overhead and not hit losses. So what we modeled, and when I say modeled, we have a very large spreadsheet model that goes out 10 years that covers every aspect of art service operation down to pilot uniform costs, demo flights, you name it, it's in there. It started based on my operating model for linear air, and then it's been enhanced and reviewed by airline experts and enhanced further. And what turns out is in order to offer those low prices, we need an aircraft that can do four round trips per day. With four round trips per day on these regional routes, we can make nice profits. What, what happens if you only do one trip per day? Well, you have big losses. And somewhere in between, there's a break even. And that break even is somewhere on three, as it turns out. Um, but uh, if you can only do three, you're not going to make money. That's the problem. You got to get up to four, and then you start having profits. So, what is this overhead that I keep talking about? Uh, if you're not familiar, if you haven't had a PL responsibility or had to think about this too hard, uh, in an aviation business, we have amortization of the purchase price of the aircraft. So, you got to cover cost of the aircraft with your ticket sales. Um, there's financing costs, you gotta pay interest. Uh, you gotta rent hangers, you've got a lot of spare parts sitting around and, and those tie up cash, so there's carrying costs on that, lost, lost interest value basically. There's insurance, registration fees, data subscriptions. Oh, pilot pay, pilot pay benefits and training. Not insignificant. To fly a schedule that business people want, which means frequent departures, so that if a meeting runs long, they can get on the next flight. Uh, it turns out we actually have to have two shifts of two crews for our aircraft. So to operate six aircraft on a route, we actually need to have 28 pilots available, believe it or not. Um, so pilot pay benefits and training really adds up. Um, then of course there's marketing, management, office rent, et cetera. So that's all the overhead of running an aviation business that you have to cover. And none of that has anything to do with how you build the aircraft, not directly. So how you build the aircraft is driven, has to be driven by, well, how can I cover all of those things uh, and have profits left over? So that's how we design the VI. Every single change of the VI 400, we go back to that model and we review what is the impact going to be on this picture. Do we still end up with profits at the end of the day? And uh, we've, so far, we've been very successful doing that as we refine the design over time. So that's how we got... Uh, that, that's the concept we got here. And I just want to share the next couple of minutes a little bit uh, more background on us. Transcend is not a Johnny come lately. The evolution of our prototypes dates back to 2009. Uh, our current design for the Vi 400 has a lineage that includes 16 flying prototypes, of which 15 were EV tall prototypes of different plan forms. I think we may have flown more different EV tall plan forms than anyone else has. Uh, they also include one gasoline-powered manned 2,000-pound manned prototype aircraft, which was a tilt wing, which you see down here. Um, so our design has been highly informed by flying real aircraft at scale, uh, both 
subscale and full scale, as well as a huge amount of analysis, simulation, um, and other work. So I talked about high-speed VTOL giving us access to city centers. Well, the key to that is city centers to city center travel has symmetric demand. One of the things that's really hard to deal with, especially with on-demand mobility, is you have asymmetric demand. People want to go from the suburbs to downtown in the morning to work, and they want to come back in the afternoon. The aircraft's empty the rest of the day, or it's, and it's empty coming back on each of those legs. So it has to take people downtown, come back empty. Um, same with leisure travel. People want to travel to the Shoreline Islands on a Friday night. Nobody wants to come back from Martha's Vineyard on Friday night. So you're empty coming back. And that immediately sort of doubles the cost of the ticket price. So what you want, I realized through my operating experience, is scheduled service with symmetric demand. That unlocks a really large and profitable total addressable market for our art service. So hence city centers. And to get to city centers, you need VTOL. Uh, and then competitive price. Well, I just went through how four trips per day are key to letting us offer this competitive price. So we should be able to move millions of customers per year in an entirely new and better way. We have a great team. Uh, here's some of our senior folks. Uh, Cliff Gonzalez, our chief engineer, 40 years in the rotorcraft industry, uh, command helicopter, chief, CTO, chief engineer there, um, backed up by a, a deep bench. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just want to say the reason all of these people are working on our program is that when they hear this story of the VI, the choices we made, why we made it, um, pros, especially from the aerospace industry, fall in love with it and want to participate. And we have been really fortunate to attract top tier set of folks uh, to help us get this done. Uh, we've also lined up some key strategic partnerships that are key to our scaling. So I mentioned that we selected the GE CT7-8 engine to power the aircraft. GE will be supplying us with engines through our certification and development program as part of this partnership. Uh, we've partnered with Command Helicopter, makers of the K-Max and Sea Sprite helicopters, and soon the Cargo UAV uh, helicopter, um, uh, multi-copter. And that collaboration is key because, again, another way in which we're unusual is our focus is on running the art service. It's not on becoming an aircraft manufacturer. So we're delighted to partner with an established aircraft manufacturer who already knows how to build and certify aircraft to build and help us certify the VI and supply it to us. I mentioned Prometheus Fuels, uh, and I want to emphasize again, their electrofuel technology is revolutionary, not just for our service. Uh, it's, I think, going to grow to become a key component to rapidly decarbonizing in the way we must do uh, to address climate change. Um, so I'm, I'm just delighted to see their technology and super excited that we get to participate in that. And then I mentioned Lily Heli, I, I mentioned the Viports and the pads have the ability to capture runoff and make sure there's no emission. Well, that's a direct result of our partnership with Lily Helipads, who invented this technology for sustainable uh, helipads. And we have the exclusive collaboration rights to put those on waterborne infrastructure for our Viports. So that's it for my prepared slides. And I wanted to just go ahead and see if uh, anybody has any questions. All right, uh, thanks for that, Peter. Um, guys, um, we do have time for questions now if you'd like to send some in. Peter has some additional slides as well. If, um, if we don't get any questions now, then we can of course go into those if we need to. Uh, but I'd like to remind everybody that we will take questions for about 10 minutes, thereabouts, um, 10 to 15 minutes. So keep them coming, guys, and we will uh, get straight into them. Um, All right. We'll take we'll the look. first question, then, uh, Peter, if, you, if you're ready. Please. Yep. What? This question, oh, it is a bit of a detailed one. I've pulled it up on screen, guys, as well, for everyone to see. It comes from James um, with Jet Perfect Foundation. And he says, given the bill, 525 Relentless has taken uh, 10 years to get close to certification and the AW609 is 20 years after first flight and is not certified yet. How do you think this platform has not yet flown and is not backed by a company with years of certification, certification experience, will be certified, ready for passengers, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, it's a great question, a very fair question. Um, and there are several components to the answer. So uh, since there were several parts of the question, let me go through and address them. Um, first thing, I need to point out the, the Bell 525 Relentless uh, 
pioneered fly-by-wire for a twin-engine uh, helicopter, um, and that required a lot of invention, uh, and it required a lot of working with certification authorities. Fortunately for us, that has helped blaze a trail for our own fly-by-wire uh, implementation. I, the 525 is also a much bigger aircraft. It's a much more complex aircraft. Uh, we, as I said, we view complexity as the enemy, and so we've made this aircraft super simple. We do not have rotor heads. It is not a tilt rotor. It's a tilt wing. We have propellers with variable collective, but no cyclic. So if you just do a part count, uh, mechanically, the aircraft is fairly more than 100 times simpler than the Relentless would be. So that helps enormously with certification and development costs, of course. Uh, the, um, the 609 is sort of a unique uh, aircraft. Uh, you know, it was the Bell Boeing 609, and then Boeing bowed out, and then it was the Bell 609, and then Bell recruited Augusta. Uh, so it was the Bell Augusta 609, and then Bell bowed out, and it was the Augusta 609, and then they bought Westland, it was the Augusta Westland 609, and then they spun that out to Leonardo. Um, you have to ask why the boards of Boeing and Bell bowed out if this was a promising aircraft. Um, I can tell you from the analysis I showed with my Venn diagram, the real problem is there's no, there's no market for the 609, unfortunately. Um, and it's going to be too expensive and not offer enough capability to uh, you know, attract enough purchases to come close to amortizing its development cost. So that, I think, drives home the importance of not designing aircraft based on what's technologically possible, but on missions that can make money for the operator of that aircraft, because that's why they'll buy it, um, and pass through enough to cover the cost of the program. So we have flown. We've been flying prototypes for a couple of years now, fifth scale prototypes. So we have flown this plan form, and we have developed the aerodynamics of it, the flight control systems, on the subscale prototypes, which is a very efficient way to do it. Next stage for the program is to go fly full-scale prototypes. Uh, and it's we are not a company with years of certification experience, but Command Helicopter certainly is. So that's one of the key reasons why we're partnering with Command to develop the aircraft and certify it. So, uh, you know, I think we really do. We, we have a plan that shows that we can be certified uh, by 2025. And uh, with let, regard to the last part of this, requirements for auto rotation and tilt rotors, well, we're not a tilt rotor. So we'll have our own special conditions for dealing with uh, loss of power. And we will not auto-rotate. Uh, we will either fly nominally if with a low altitude loss of power using the electric battery backup to our one megawatt motor generator. So it just it's a normal flight to return to landing like a you know like one engine in op with a twin engine helicopter. Uh, or if we're high enough, we pop out the parachute. And that is a steerable parachute for the descent to landing. <clears throat> so that's the answer to all those parts. Brilliant. Um, Peter, there are a couple of questions. Next one comes from Mike with Hypertech Research, and he's looking for a rough price from one city to another, um, and he'd like for you to name some cities as well. Yeah, you can look on the, <clears throat> excuse me one second. If you look on the transcend.aero website, you'll see we have three example routes and pricing for them. <clears throat> and uh, I guess you can say roughly it comes out to be something around $300 one way uh, per flight, which is, granted, more expensive than an airline ticket, but we're not just competing with an airline ticket. We're competing with the ground travel as well as the airline ticket. So when you add in the fact that an Uber to the airport through congested traffic at peak travel times is often somewhere between $60 to $100, that's where we become competitive. It's on full door-to-door, hard-dollar travel cost. I can go to a CFO of a major company and show them how they can save 5 to 10% on their hard-dollar, door-to-door travel costs for some decent section of their city-to-city -city travelers, and they will take that meeting all day. I know because I've had those conversations. Right, strong case there, um, Peter, from you. Uh, we'll take the next question as well. Guys, we will take questions for a little bit longer. So um, yeah, you might want to send another couple of questions in for us to take. This one comes from Naresh Sharma, and he says, um, yeah, he's, it's a comment, not so much a question. He says, this shape looks very similar to auto aviation's aircraft, except, uh, of course, the tilt wing. Yeah, that is that is a fair point. Um, auto has a more rounded shape to it. Uh, they like to, the Solera, they, they like to talk about having achieved laminar flow. 
Um, I wouldn't go quite that far. Oh, thank you. Yes. But you can see that we do have this very classic bullet shaped profile. Um, and the point of that is drag reduction, right? Top speed comes when thrust equals drag. And so we do everything we possibly can to reduce drag on this aircraft. Um, and uh, we'll continue to do so. It's a constant battle to avoid the temptation to add any drag to it. Yeah, really exciting. We'll take the next question as well. This one is from uh, David Author, um, and he is with Over Air. And let's have a look. He says, how does the aircraft deal with one a rotor in operative at low altitude? Uh, it, that is an impossible failure because the propellers, not rotors, uh, the propellers are mechanically linked in the drivetrain. So we distribute the power from the turbine to the propellers mechanically, not electrically, because the trade showed that was substantially lighter when we're dealing with putting most of a megawatt out to each, each propeller. So they're mechanically linked. So if one stops, they both stop. Um, we have an overrunning clutch on the drivetrain. So if, if, either, if a propeller stops and the engine, engine keeps turning, you know, the clutch keeps things from breaking. Um, and if the engine stops, the propellers are turning, then we switch over to the um, megawatt generator, turn the props and fly normally. Brilliant. All right, guys, we have time for another two questions and I do have those questions. So um, I would advise you at this point to uh, hold off questions. If you do want to take things offline with Peter, um, you can, of course, uh, make contact with him after this meeting. Next question, Peter, is from with um, next question comes from uh, Airbus, uh, Catalan uh, Perju is uh, the gentleman's name. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question or another comment. Right, he says steerable parachute in case of emergency would require very quick opening and probably a minimum of glide ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Question is correct. Yep, yeah, that is correct. The uh, the parachute deployment is going to be, uh, you, you can, you'll be able to initiate it manually, but there are some failure cases where it will be automatically initiated by the flight or flight control system because timing is essential. Um, but the, the way the VI controls yaw is in helicopter mode by deflecting the trailing edge flapper rods and with use of rudders on the tail. So we have electric actuation and a fairly large battery as a buffer in the electrical system and also to provide emergency power. So when we deploy the parachute, we can point the nose of the aircraft by yawing it with the flapper rods and the rudders. We generate thrust either with tilting the wing backwards or with uh, open panels in the top of the canopy so that we can go forward. So that's how we get the steerable descent to land. All right. Thank you for that, Peter. We'll take the final question. This one, um, the gentleman Murat from GTU, he does say that the question might be a little bit off topic, but could the um, Prometheus uh, fuel generation process be utilized solely for decarbonization worldwide? Do you think we will see vast storage sites for car captured carbon, even if that might not be profitable? Uh, it's a great question. I, I really think that Prometheus has a shot at becoming a household name later in this century as one of those technologies that uh, is just ubiquitous because it is that kind of a breakthrough. So I think it, I, and I hope, and, it, and if not Prometheus, uh, you know, there, there are some compet competitors out there. But uh, I strongly suspect that that will enable us to continue to use our liquid fuels infrastructure and trucks and ships and aircraft for long enough that we can, you know, fully decarbonize while we shift to, you know, potentially more efficient technologies. You know, the jury's out yet on when batteries would actually be more efficient for aviation than liquid fuels and turbine engines, depending on the aircraft and the mission. But you know, the farther and faster you want to go, the better turbines stack up, stack up for that. So yeah, I, I believe that um, you know you that technology is going to be critical for decarbonization, and it's because of the second part: vast storage sites when they're not profitable can only be achieved by government subsidy, um, and you know we'll have to see how much the government wants to subsidize this. It's a critical obviously a thing for humanity that we pursue this. Um, but the great thing about Prometheus that I didn't mention is their process is less expensive than pulling fossil fuels out of the ground and refining them. They can deliver a per gallon jet A price that is lower than if I buy fossil fuels. 
So again, like our service where it has to be faster and cheaper to capture the mass market, Prometheus is making something that's zero carbon and cheaper. That's the revolution. Great, famous last words. Uh, that's a good way to sort of wrap things up. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us, uh, of course, and being the, the keynote. Um, um, yeah, I don't think I could have uh, thought of anyone better to sort of open up day two of the meeting. So I really appreciate you making the time. Well, it was a great pleasure to be here and offer our sort of uh, unique take on this uh, VTOL technology evolution, electric evolution. I uh, thank you for the opportunity. Okay.